Hello, welcome to this time of worship. Let us listen for a word from the Lord as Ron reads the scriptures to us. The gospel lesson for today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they didn't understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it into his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Paula D'R.C. says that God comes to us disguised as life. I'm filming outside where you can hear the sound of planes, trucks backing up, maybe a lawnmower or blower. It's all part of God. God comes to us disguised as life. The sounds of life are all around us. The signs of life and death and resurrection are all around us. I like preaching outdoors because you can see nature, God's first language. You'll see behind me here at the parsonage, every once in a while a leaf will fall. You'll see that happening all around us now in this September and October time. Images of the trees letting go, trusting the rhythm of death and resurrection, that somehow out of letting go of something, new life will come from the soil that is nurtured by that dying leaf. The Paschal mystery, as the church has called it for 2,000 years, is all around us. And Jesus was just pointing to that mystery, that language of God, of death and resurrection. And he, in today's passage that we just heard read to us by Ron, is part of that. Jesus is saying to the disciples, this is what will happen to the Son of Man. He will be killed, and he will rise again. It is not only the rhythm for Jesus, but it is the rhythm for us too, and for the disciples. As is so often the case when Jesus is talking about death and resurrection, the disciples don't want to hear it. Last week we heard about Peter saying, taking Jesus aside and saying, look, we don't want to hear anything about death and resurrection. And Jesus said, hey, get behind me, Satan. Peter, you must know and embrace this rhythm because this is the rhythm of God. And this is the rhythm of all who follow Jesus. And we're invited into that space of trust. That loss is a part of life, but it never has the last word. Death is a part of life, but it doesn't have the last word. God is always bringing forth new life, resurrection, hope out of loss, out of death, out of even injustice. The disciples don't want to hear about it or talk about it or even ask questions about it. So they start discussing who's the most important one of them. <laughs> who's going to have the most power of the twelve? Who will be the most respected? And Jesus says to them, what were you talking about? And they kind of know that they've been busted. <laughs> they know that they really are talking about the wrong thing. And Jesus asks the question and they respond with silence. Jesus said, 
if you really want to be great, then you must be servant of all. And then he picks up a child. We don't know whose child it is. Some theologians wonder if it was Jesus' child. Oh, in some certain circles that is so scandalous to even think about. I remember hearing Joan Chittister speak in Morristown a few years ago and she said, why couldn't Jesus have a child? If God had a child, why couldn't Jesus? <laughs> a good question. Maybe it was a street child just running around the streets without a parent around. Maybe a child who was dirty from playing in the streets, dirty from being homeless in the streets. We don't know. I wonder if it was a nursing child, totally dependent on his or her mother for nurture, for food, for life. Maybe it was a child with special needs. We don't know, but it was a child. And in antiquity, children were without respect, without status. They were like non-people. They weren't talked about. They weren't written about because they weren't valued. It's hard for us in the 21st century to get our minds around children not being valued. But in Jesus' day, they were seen as to be with their mothers and not around rabbis teaching disciples. But Jesus picked up this child and we don't know how long he may have just held that child or sat that child on his lap or played with that child, or looked into that child's face, almost ignoring the disciples. To say to the disciples, value this little one, value this little one. We know from then on the Christian church began to value children of every age of the church. We knew that because Jesus picked up a child and said, look at this little one and value this little one, followers of Jesus needed to do the same. He said to his disciple, disciples, whoever welcomes this child welcomes me and welcomes the one who sent me. Jesus is saying to the disciples, this little child is my emissary. This little child represent, represents me and represents the one who sent me. This is radical for Jesus to be teaching the disciples. Maybe Jesus was saying to the disciples, learn from the one who is dependent on others for food, for well-being, for shelter. For nurture. Learn from the one who is not respected at all in society and receive them as you would receive the Christ. Maybe Jesus is turning the world on its head with this illustration, this metaphor, this embrace of a child by saying your value and your importance doesn't come from the way that society respects human beings or doesn't respect human beings. Henry Nouwen often would say, our true identity does not come from what we do. Our true identity does not come from what we have. Our true identity does not come from what people say about us. Our true identity comes from being a beloved child of God. 
Jesus says to his disciples and to us, if you really want to be important, be a servant. Serve someone. Serve everyone. For that is what God values. Last week, as we were remembering 9-11, I shared some wisdom from psychologists and psychiatrists and counselors who are always anticipating a rise in anxiety and low-grade depression and full-on depression from the end of August through the month of September as the New York metropolitan area and other areas deeply impacted, personally impacted by the loss of 9-11, those levels of anxiety and depression are rising from the end of August as we anticipate another anniversary of 9-11 and especially this year as we recognize the 20th anniversary of the losses and trauma of 9-11. Layered on top of that, therapists are realizing that the effect of the pandemic over the last year and a half have heightened those numbers of anxiety, low-grade depression, and full-on depression by about three times. Layers of trauma that not only some people have experienced, but in this pandemic, we've all experienced those losses. And it is not easy for us. And I share that again this week because I want to help us to recognize that we are all dealing with some anxiety that wasn't there years ago. Perhaps some low-grade depression or depression that may not have been there years ago because of this pandemic. And we need to walk gently with one another and gently with our neighbor and our family members and our brothers and sisters in Christ, because we're all going through a very difficult time. Therapists and counselors and pastors and people who have helped others deal with their own struggles know that there's wisdom in what Jesus is saying by saying, to be great is to serve. To find wholeness and fulfillment is to serve. To find meaning is to serve. Friends, whatever landscape you may be walking through, can you think of someone in your circle, in your life, in your neighborhood, who you can serve? And just focus on caring for them. Maybe it's one person. Maybe it's a whole group of people. I've heard people in our church say about the ministries they're involved in, you know, I have found such purpose in this ministry, which helps other people. I've heard it this year often from people in our congregation and outside of our congregation who are working in our back parking lot or with the food pantry, that they have found meaning in the midst of a time where there's a lot of anxiety. And they have found even joy in serving, in this case, hungry people. Whoever those folks are that we can help, or whoever that person is who you've already been thinking about in these last few moments, that might benefit from your help. That may be God's way of saying this, this person, this opportunity, this opportunity to serve may be the way that God blesses us and them. It's a mutual gift to serve someone. Who will you serve today? Who will you serve this week? Who will you serve in this season of life? Whoever that is, know that you have Christ's blessing to do that. May it be so for you and for me and for the Church of Jesus Christ throughout the world. Amen.
Thank you for joining us in this time of seeking God, this time of God seeking us with nothing but love. Let us go from our screens knowing that God is with us and will be there. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace today, in the days to come, and forevermore. Amen.